Hi, I'm James Taylor, business creativity and innovation keynote speaker, and this is The Creative Life, a show dedicated to you, the creative. If you're looking for motivation, inspiration, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's an author, musician, entrepreneur, performer, designer, or thought leader. They'll share with you their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, and much, much more. You'll find show notes for this episode, as well as free training on creativity, over at jamestaylor.me. Enjoy this episode. Hi, it's James Taylor here. Today's episode was first aired as part of International Authors Summit. This inspiring virtual summit reveals the secrets of making, marketing, and monetizing a best-selling book. If you would like to access the full video version as well as in-depth sessions with over 40 best-selling authors, then I've got a very special offer for you. Just go to internationalauthorssummit.com where you'll be able to register for a free pass for the summit. Yeah, that's right. Over 40 New York Times and Amazon best-selling authors, book editors, agents, and publishers sharing their insights, strategies, and tactics on how to write and market your first or next bestseller. So just go to internationalauthorssummit.com, but not before you listen to today's episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted to welcome onto the summit today, Annalisa Parent. Annalisa Parent helps experts and business owners to write, publish, and sell client magnet books to massively scale their brands and businesses. She is the founder of Date With The Muse and co-founder of Laurel Elite Books, the latter offering full service publishing. Annalisa writes for many local, national, and international publications and has been featured on Huffington Post Live, as well as CBS, Associated Press, and Korean Broadcast Systems. She believes in taking the writing craft seriously without taking herself too seriously, and attempts to heed the wisdom of the ancient Roman poet Horace, who said, mix a little foolishness with your prudence. It's good to be silly at the right moment. What a great thing to live by. So thank you so much for coming on and joining us today, Annalisa. Thank you so much for having me, James. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So share with everyone what's going on in your world just now. Yeah, so a lot going on over at Laurel Elite Books in addition to helping experts to publish their client magnet books. I've been uh, speaking with organizations about clarity in their written communications, so newsletters, internal emails, uh, working a lot around those factors of clarity and audience, which are really important in writing. So you mentioned that word client magnet books. Describe to me, what is a what is a client magnet book? How would they differ from any other type of book that someone might be writing? So in my mind, a client magnet book is a book that will start a conversation with your ideal client so that By the time they're finished with chapter one, they're certainly going to know who you are, what you stand for, and how you can help them to solve their unique problem, what your unique solution is. And certainly by the end of that book, uh, if they're the right fit for what you offer and how you offer it, that conversation has moved forward exponentially. By the last page, they're ready to get on a call with you, talk with you about how you can help them to solve their problem. And you work with lots of different types of writers, obviously a lot of nonfiction writers, people that are using the books, as you say, to bring in a potential custom to their, their business, build their brands. I'm wondering, is there any particular type of book that you find works better for those those client magnet books? You know, we sometimes see the, the kind of more storytelling. I'm thinking like the almost like the E-Myth Revisited, where they use kind of like fictional, almost like narrative uh, that's kind of going on there. And then you have the more like, here's what to do, the ABC of something. And then you have like lots of things in between. Uh, What books do you find tend to work best when it comes to writing these very specific, more kind of client magnet books? You know, you're talking about different styles and the degree to which story is used. And uh, one of my favorite business gurus out there, although he balks at the term guru, uh, Bob Burr, says story sells and it does in fact sell and uh, for those of you who have read any of the books in the go-giver series which he co-authors you know he's using a parable to get his business message across and so that's on the far extreme of how we can use story to sell and then on the other end of the spectrum we have a really straightforward informative sort of our classic non-fiction book 
I would say that the ideal expert book is going to fall smack dab in the middle of those two. So certainly we want to be giving some information, some helpful information, and there will be story included. And so some people want to, because they're good at or they like to fictionalize or create a parable that that is woven throughout. Uh, we might see an ideal client make progress through the book, for example. Um, or more simply put, we can include anecdotes of people who have gone through our programs, people we've helped who have been successful to really show what it can look like to start in one place and end in another after working with us. So to summarize, it's really a perfect blend of both story and telling to really get that reader engaged. But we're, we're programmed for story that's from a neuroscientific standpoint. So certainly uh, getting those stories in there is, is engaging. And it's also helpful for the illustration for the client to see what it is that you do and how you can do it and what that can look like. Absolutely. I mean, I think I, I, I just read two books recently and one, the one kind of similar topic, really, the one kind of marketing. One book was heavy research driven. It was written by a, a very good academic. But at the end of it, I felt I felt, OK, I know all this information, but like, what do I do with it? There was no like, you know, there was no kind of how to nothing in terms of actionables. And, and I felt the book was maybe poor for that. And then the other book I read used a parable of a a guy who was, it was almost a little bit of that kind of e-myth um, type of format where it was a story of a guy had a, a bike shop and he was looking to improve his bike shop. And then there was a cyclist who used to come in who was a very successful businessman who could basically help say, these are the seven things in your business that you need to focus on. And as I, and, and it was a very good, very much more simple book, but very well ordered, well structured, well thought out. And, and I think now of the books that I've, the one I've suggested more often is that second one. It's the one that weaves the story in, but there's very strong kind of actionables. And, and, and it's easy for me to say to someone, oh, I've just read this book and it's about such and such and it covers such and such. It was much easier for me to do that one rather than the talk about the academic, which I, I guess goes to your point of having that that blend. Yeah. You know, in the one case, you read a book that was too heavy on theory. Uh, you know, putting on my professor hat, I certainly have lived in academia and I enjoy a good theoretical discussion as much as any other professor. Uh, but there's a time and a place for that. And so if we're looking to do something to implement something, we do need those actionable steps. Um, and showing those to your potential client shows that you know your stuff, you know how to do this, you know how to solve this problem. Now you work with lots of experts, people who, whatever their field is, they've quite all this knowledge, expertise, they may be well known in their particular field, but not known more, more generally. What are, the, what are some of the, the challenges or mistakes that you see them make early on when they then look to take that all that knowledge, all that years of experience from their head and put it into book form in order to bring in clients and help build their brand. Yeah, so I would say the top two mistakes that I see are the wrong kind of book or expecting a book to do too much. So uh, the wrong kind of book, people want a shortcut and so they create sort of like these quote collections or even worse, they throw together all of their blog entries and none of them really go together. Um, and I've heard that there are people coaching that out there. Don't listen to them, it doesn't work. Um, you know, because what you want is a conversation. And, you know, if I hung out with you at the cocktail party, James, and I was like, and Abe Lincoln said, and then Ben Franklin said, you would just think that I was weird and we would not be no. having a conversation. So that doesn't work to start a conversation. That's really our goal is how do we get them into a conversation? And then the second point is, you know, there may be many, many, many books in you. Uh, and people, when they come to their first book, they say, oh, I know a lot about A, and then sometimes I help people with B, and then this one time I help a person with C, and they think that they need to include every single thing that they know in that one book. And if that feels or sounds overwhelming, it is. And so, you know, streamlining that information so that we can connect on one conversation that makes sense. So if we go back to that cocktail party analogy, if I'm standing next to you with my pinky up and my hand on the stem and I say, you know, I like basketball and I like baseball and sometimes I ski and I like I've given you way too much information. If I just say, you know, I went skiing last weekend, well, then we can have a conversation 
conversation about, you know, do you ski? Do you like skiing? Where do you ski? All of those things um, versus too much information. So finding that perfect topic and what the chronology will be of what's book one, what's your most important message to be the forerunner, and then how do you follow that up with book two, book three, oh, okay. and so on, um, so that you can continue that conversation with potential clients. Because those people who really love you and love book one are going to be eager for book two. So when you're working with authors, you actually sit down with them and they have all these ideas and you actually almost can plan out what that book one, book two book three, even if, if, even if you're not completely sure, you know, full details of book two and book three, but the, you've got the big, you know, bucket. So this is what it goes into. I'm wondering when that, so you, you've kind of mapped out a little bit of a roadmap for them of a couple of books. So that helps them feel a bit more relaxed. Yeah, I don't have to put everything in this book one. Coming back to book one though, how do you start to outline it? You, you know, even on, if you just take one of those three things that you might be doing, you say, okay, this is the thing we're going to, this is the kind of book we're going to write. How do you start to kind of get your hands around a book, uh, you know, how, to, to, to decide what the book's going to do, who it's going to serve? Absolutely. So I would say that 90% of the people who come to us would say, I'm not a writer, but I want to write a book. So they're not coming from, you know, MFA programs, learning how to write. They might have even hated writing when they were in school. And so our programs are specifically targeted to help those kind of people to answer those kind of questions, right? Where do I even start with all of this? What stories do I include? Because those are really important questions to be asking. So these people are asking all of the right questions and we're helping them to find the right answers. And one of the ways that we do that, James, is to back it up because some people sort of put the cart before the horse and they think that they just need a book. But it's not a book, it's a scaling tool. And it can't be a scaling tool unless we've got a strategy. So I, there are two people who come to me. They either say, I've got a book and I don't know where to start, or I already wrote a book and it's not selling. What do I do now? So when we start with people at the idea stage, we're taking people not just through how do I write a book, how do I organize my ideas? Those are all important things, of course, but they're more directly tied to the marketing strategy that we're going to implement so that that message gets into the hands of the people who need it. So we're answering all of those questions at once because really it's the same question. Who's the audience for my book mm -hmm. is who's the audience for my business? Same avatar. So how are we going to target that person not only with the book, but how are we going to get that book into that person's hands? What about this book is going to be appealing? So we're backing it up way even before we're putting words on a page because what we're really creating is a strategy, the strategy that is book specific and the strategy that is business specific. And on the Venn diagram, there's a lot of overlap there, but we need a lot of clarity around what we want this book to do do for the author. And that's an important question to be asking as well when we consider what goes in book one, what goes in book two, what goes in book three, we're thinking about the purpose of those books. Mm -hmm. They might be a slightly different arm of the strategy in the sense that, you know, you might put out Facebook ads and you might put out Twitter ads. Those are both social media ads, but your targeting might be a little different and your strategy might be a little different. We need to get into the intricacies of all of those details so that we can put together a solid scaling tool that we call a book. And in that conversation, as you start kind of go going in, identifying the avatar, what the overall strategy is for the book, I I'm I'm guessing the conversation comes up relatively early from the author of saying, should I be finding a traditional publisher and getting a book deal? Should I be independently publishing with a with an independent publisher, a hybrid model? What, what you know, what, where where should I be going? How, how do you approach that conversation? Absolutely. So. That's a question that a lot of people have. And the good news for entrepreneurs, coaches, consultants out there is that self-publishing or hybrid publishing work really well in this particular genre. If you told me you wanted to write a mystery novel, that would be a very different conversation. But sales are really good in those two venues. Now, I'm a little biased in this question because I own and operate a publishing company that takes you from idea to sold. So we're publishing that book 
for our clients. And that's really great that we take them from, I have an idea, what do I do, all the way through, I have a book in my hands and I know how to sell it, because we get the consistency of branding and the consistency of the marketing strategy and the consistency of having a team behind you. So I'm a little biased in thinking that that's the very best way to do it because that's how I do it. Um, and because a lot of those people that I said, those 50% of the people who come to me and say, uh, I wrote a book, but it's not selling, are people who just slapped it up on Amazon and expected the world to flock to them. If you build it, they'll come without any strategy to make that happen. So. So you, it's almost like it's almost like a continuum there, like with traditional publishers at one end, absolutely self-published, where you just say, literally, I just write it, I'm just going to throw it up onto Amazon, and then you've got this this hybrid somewhere in, in the middle, which is hopefully taking the best part of, of traditional publishing, giving you know giving you access, and also helping you through that process, almost like in the music industry, like that kind of A and R process, the 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 editing process, but at the same time that gives you enough speed and flexibility which you might be lacking with a traditional publisher absolutely i think that you hit the nail on the head right there james and if i can just send a word of caution out there i mean obviously i think i'm the best solution for that out there but i recognize that i am not the only publisher out there offering this so um people say well how do i choose like what's the best way to choose and um my one word of caution is is this look for the results that you want for your book. So I work really well with people who want to put a quality message about a quality solution into the hands of their ideal client and sell actual books for money. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of publishers out there and this like you're going to hear my ire raised because this infuriates my sensibilities um, who promise you an Amazon bestseller. And the way that they do this is they create an arbitrary category, you know, books with orange covers. And suddenly you've sold two books and you're the bestseller in the books with orange covers category. Hooray. But you only sold two books. But you get to call yourself a quote unquote bestseller. You only sold two books. So that's not a goal that I think is important. For me, that's like the perfect attendance award that you got in the third grade. It's not getting you anything. What I want for my authors is that, is that they actually sell books, not that they sell two books so they can call themselves a bestseller. So that's just a word of caution. Now, there may be some listeners out there who say, no, I really want to have that sticker to put on the front of my book. And that's important to me. And that's that's fine. But it's not actually selling you any books. So like those hybrid publishers, then they're they're not all of the same flavor. They, they, they get the label with hybrid publisher, but that can range from quite hands-off styles of publishers to something much more. I mean, the, 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 I know the type of uh, publishing that you work with, you're also working a lot on that, uh, that um, almost like coaching process that's kind of going on there as well. And obviously then the editing and, and all the publishing and then helping you know, things about marketing as well. But at that very first on, on the on the coaching um, side of things. I think this is actually quite an undervalued uh, piece uh, of it. And I think it's something that you, you I know you, you, you put a lot of uh, energy and a lot of effort with your ready. So I'd be interested to know, what does it look like to work with, with a, a hybrid publisher that, that you, like you that does have that coaching piece as part of it? Yeah, so we really walk alongside the author. And so when they're in the writing phase, they're getting weekly support from our writing coaching team. So sometimes that's me, sometimes it's somebody else on the team, especially if they're not writers, they're really going to want that feedback of like, well, where do I even start? Or does this make sense? How do I make that work? And let's not overlook the emotional component of that, right? And, you know, we're supposed to be so professional. Oh, you know what? Writing makes people cry for lots of different reasons. There's a vulnerability there. There could be a frustration there. There can be a lot of fear um, in expressing yourself. Will people like it? What if they hate it? What if they love it? Those are all realities of that situation to say nothing of the fear of putting your message out there in the world for strangers to read. That's kind of a strange phenomenon that a book does. So we're working not only with entrepreneurs to scale a business, not only with authors to get their message out into the world, but with people 
to work through what the reality of getting your message out into the world is. And I would say that's a differentiating factor for us. We're not a mill who's just going to take anybody and churn out a book that doesn't matter what the content is. That's not what we're about at all. We're about quality connections, quality messages, and quality books. It's interesting. I was talking to an author recently who she was working on her first book and nonfiction book business and she's very successful in business and she said i'm going to write this book and i'm not really going to put it's not going to be my stories i don't want to be i don't want to put any of my me into it it's just going to be about business and things and as she was writing it she was really struggling with it and then uh, i think the person she was working with or the editor said you need to be adding yourself in here i can't see you in this book i can't hear you i can't see you in this book and she started adding those things very reluctantly at first. And then as she was getting feedback, both from the person she was working with there and also just some support network that she had around her, they were saying, that's the bit that we love. Keep that, keep that. And now she's on the, going doing the book tours. She's doing speaking and everything. And she said, whenever people come up to book, they said, I love that story that you told when you were 12 and that thing happened. And actually she's talking about a book which is all about big business. But that's what, as you say, going back to your very first point at the beginning of this interview, that's what people remember. They remember stories, parables. Yeah, absolutely. And I completely understand where she started, right? Because it's really scary to share of ourselves and it feels like we can shortcut it and tell other people's stories. And, you know, I can say from personal experience, James, my most recent book is a business book. It's my expert entrepreneur book. And uh, in your intro, you gave that quote from Horace about being silly at the right times. This book is extraordinary, extraordinarily intellectually geeky. I geek out on writing big time. And I'm pretty dang silly in the book as well. So if you read my Amazon reviews, there are people who love that mix. And there are people that hate that mix. And my opinion on that is that's okay. There are people out there who aren't going to jive with my vibe. And that's okay. They should work with someone else who's going to really get them and be able to take them where they need to go. But it's doing something magical in that the people who are ideal to work with me are the people who are going to love that book. And that's the part of the conversation that's so important, is that authenticity. If I go into the cocktail party pretending to be someone that I'm not, I might have some good conversations, but I'm probably not going to come out with any friends. Now, when you absolutely, I mean, I, I, it, and it, it rings not just, it rings true in not just in a book when you read it and it, it you just, it, it just, it's kind of just like flies off the page, it sings off the page. And I think when you hear it, when a speaker, you're talking about, you know, going and speaking at events as well. I think you instantly know when that speaker is telling something and it's coming from a, a deeper part, it's coming from an intro, even like if it, it's, a, it's a silly story, a funny story, but there's just, there's, a, it changes the energy in the room. Um, it's a difficult way, to, I, I can't really explain it any better than that really, but you, you feel it rather than this, this is stuff I've learned from books. I'm maybe regurgitating something here as well. Um, so you move from then into the, I'm interested as you start moving into this kind of editing stage, so you're getting, creating all this content. When it comes to the editing, I hear all these different phrases all the time about different types of editors. So we hear um, content editors, dev developmental editors, structural editors, copy editors. So like, so break it down for me. When we hear all these different, what, what are the different types of editors that you will often deal with as an author? So at the end of the day, regardless of title, you need someone who's going to help you with the content. So content editors, developmental editors, structural editors, all of those fall under that. Um, they are slightly different, but they're all dealing with content. And then when you're finished, finished, when you're ready to publish, when you're ready to submit, then you need a copy editor. And this is the brilliant person who comes in and makes sure that all of your commas are in the right place and you didn't misspell things and that your manuscript is just cleaned up. Now, let's go back to the content because there are a bunch of different types of editors. So a structural editor is exactly what it sounds like. They're going to help you to work on the structure. A developmental editor and a content editor, those 
are sometimes used interchangeably and sometimes not. Typically, those editors are helping you to put together the content. So uh, I was meeting with one of our authors this morning, and we were moving around paragraphs from chapter three and putting them into the introduction because it made more sense there. Um, and then we had to fix some of the transitions to make it work. That's the kind of work that a good content editor should be helping you with. And, you know, just as, you know, for making a checklist of good attributes of an editor, I always read the entire draft of a manuscript before I start working with the author, because I want to have a full comprehensive view of the entire message mm -hmm. before we get started. And that's not true for all editors. So, you need to decide if that's an important attribute for you in your editor, and that would be a question to ask if you're looking to hire someone. And I'm thinking, I don't necessarily know this in, in nonfiction, but but you see it now a lot more. I love cold opens um, on, especially on speeches, uh, maybe not some, on, on, on books, but there's like TV series I've been watching now, like Better Call Saul or, or Breaking Bad. And they've, they've really taken a piece that you would normally see maybe a, a quarter of the way through the TV show and they put it right at the start. And your your curiosity is instantly, and, and I've, I've seen then writers when they use that and they'll put that story and it's, it's a curiosity. It's, and I can imagine from, if you're getting a book on Kindle, for example, and you only have that first one and it, it comes up to the end and says, would you like to buy this book? Or would you like to stay on the sample? That's got me hooked. I, I need to buy, <laughs> buy that book now. So that, that's like how the, the importance of structure and moving things around and, and finding out if you've got if your if the theme that you're 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 trying to put ahead is going the whole way through. I I wonder something you mentioned there was uh, this idea of of magnet customer magnets or client magnets. In terms of those calls to action, if you let's say if you're a consultant and one of your books is you want people to come and use your consulting services. Would you be looking to put those kind of calls to action right towards the start of the book or pepper throughout the book or is it something you would leave right until till the end? We pepper them throughout the book. Um, and the reason for that is that fewer than 50% of people read the full book that they've purchased. Okay. Um, so my goal in this book is that if I pick up your book, I'm your potential client and I pick it up, I can open to any page of that book and engage in a conversation with you. That means that every word needs to count and those calls to action need to come frequently enough that I can engage a reader who opens to page 51. I can engage a reader who takes a look at the index first, right? I want to be optimizing that book because again, technically it's a book, but it's really a scaling tool and we want to optimize that to the extent, the fullest extent that we can. Got it. And and in terms of tools, when you're working with authors, especially first time authors, what tools are you recommending they use in terms of writing and, and, and drafting and how you communicate with them? So we always work in Google Docs and I like Google Docs because there's only ever one draft. So we don't have to worry about version one, version two. That just gets confusing. The other thing that's really nice about Google Docs is that it does have a speech uh, feature. So you can talk to it and it will type for you. Now it's not perfect, but it, it's a good approximation. And then a lot of my authors um, find, and this is really solid neuroscience, they find that they think best when they're moving. Mm -hmm. So they'll be yeah. on the treadmill and they'll have some kind of recording device. A lot of them use apps on their phones that record for them and they might send that to somebody to transcribe or they might get an app that transcribes that for them but you know it may not be the final draft but it's at least a good approximation of the main ideas that they wanted to say which is a, a good starting place for us to fill in the gaps that's so that's so important i i think that's is undervalued when you have those ideas and you say there's a lot of science now in terms of uh, movement and its, its effect on creativity coming up with ideas and also colors you know certain colors will increase levels of you know numbers of creative ideas but there's having that something with you at all times that you can capture whether that's Evernote or whether it's just the voice recorder on your phone or if you carry a journal 
uh, because we have these ideas all the time and it, oh, I, I, I must remember to write that down and it never gets written down. <laughs> Something always comes along. What about a book? If you were to recommend um, one book, not, not one of your own books, but a book by another author, it could be on the craft of writing or um, maybe on the, on the marketing or the selling of, of your books, what would that book be? Absolutely. Hands down, On Writing Well by William Zinser. On Writing Well. That is, I've never heard of that one, so I'm, I'm definitely, I'm going to go and... Really? Oh, my goodness. This, I use excerpts from this book in all of my workshops. Uh, he's, he's brilliant, and one of the things that I really respect about him, and unfortunately we lost him about two years ago, but one of the things I really respect about him, um, I think he was up to the sixth or seventh edition of this book because over the decades he perpetually improved it to increase the clarity, to eliminate the jargon, all of the things that he coaches in that book, he lived and preached. And he also added chapters to it as we moved into, you know, a more digital world to be applicable to to today's world. So I absolutely respect his work and I love that book. Fantastic. And we'll have a link here for that as well. And final kind of question, I'd, lo- I'd love to know, because uh, we didn't really get so much time to talk about your own writing as well, but we're going to have some links uh, for that. But I'd be interested to know if, if you were that person who's starting, uh, I'm going to imagine it's yourself, you're going to be having to start again. So you've, you do have your skills, you have your writing skills, which you didn't have before. You've got the knowledge you've acquired, but you have no platform. No one knows who you are. You know no one. You're going to have to restart with your writing. What would you do? How would you restart? I think if I had to restart, I would start with the book first. So one of the stories that I've heard from uh, millionaire entrepreneurs, billionaire entrepreneurs uh, who I interview on a regular basis to talk about, you know, what's the secret to your success? How did you do it? That book for all of them was a moment where they transitioned into the next level of their business, uh, both from a confidence standpoint and from a revenue standpoint. There was a huge jump because the book gives you uh, those opportunities. You're suddenly the expert. You're on the radio. You're invited to speak. Um, and you can say, oh, have you read my book? Oh, I talk about that in my book, right? So you're you're the expert. And I think that um, as tools go, it is one of, if not the most, powerful tools you can have available for you that's a fascinating insight i i i I love the idea you know in terms of just taking a step up uh i mean is is the book's an incredible thing if you think how much information and knowledge and legacy you can put into this tiny little thing is is uh yeah we're, we're we're very fortunate to to be in this in this world and be doing it this this time in history as well if if um I know we're going to have a link here to uh, to a really cool thing you have, which is a, a consultation that you do with prospective authors, aspiring authors, or maybe professional authors who are just, as you said, they've written a book, but it's not really working for them. It's not really scaling for them. It's called a free scaling consultation. And we're going to have a link here so people can click on that link, go through to that and, and schedule that. Um, what do you tend to, when you focus on that convers- that consultation call? What what are what are the things that you look to try and do with the with the person on that call? So we're looking to get one hundred percent clarity on where these entrepreneurs, coaches, and consultants are, where they want to go, and how they can get there. It's quite simple. And if people want to just reach out to you more generally, check out about your your books and the other things that you have happening at the moment. Where's the best place for them to go and do that? Absolutely. So uh, I'm going to give myself a little shout out here. My most recent book, Storytelling for Pantsers, uh, which is my entrepreneur expert book, just won an award as the best business book of the year from the Colorado Independent Publishers Association. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, And also in the humor category. So it's fun and entertaining. Um, So you can find that on Amazon simply by searching storytelling for panzers and have it shipped straight to your home or uh, buy it in ebook form. And the audio book is on its way. We'll come out soon. Wonderful. I'm going to have a link for that as well. Um, Annalise, thank you so much for coming on today and, and helping demystify a lot of the the parts about the writing process and working with a writing coach and different types of editors. Uh, I wish you all the best with the business as it goes from strength to strength and also uh, your next book that you're working on. Thank you so much, James. It's been a real pleasure to be here today with you and your audience. 
If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.